can I speak to you about um, Morgan's salon? Yes, well, that's where I'm sitting now. Okay. And I'm, this is my home studio. Yeah. And th this, this room, it used to be a piano school. So it's ideally made for music. It's got double glazing and acoustic tiles on the ceiling. So I didn't have to do anything. It was just tailor made for music. And when I moved in here, I set up my studio and started recording and so on. And I thought, well, you know, it seems a bit selfish just to use this studio for me. Why don't I try and do some little concerts here? And so I did because I'd stopped doing Morgan's organ at Super Deluxe. So I started doing it here on a regular basis. And I realized that if I sort of pack them in a bit, I can have about 40 people sitting in this room with me and do concerts. And it's great. It's ideal because I don't have to, to lug all my equipment to a club. Yeah. It's all set up here, ready to go. So, so I've got a, a video projector. I can show visuals. And then I started, started doing that, really enjoying it. And then I thought, well, why don't I start inviting other people to come and do their thing here? Because I've always liked that salon idea, you know, Paris in the 20s, yeah. where, you know, Gertrude Stein opens her door and Picasso comes in and Debussy comes in and, you know, here's my new song. I thought, well, I'd like to do something like that. So I started inviting people not only musicians, but I had a poet. Uh, I had um, a woman who, who's a sake expert who did a sake lecture. I had a photographer. And so things like that, people are doing anything creative. Yeah. I started the, the, what I called the Morgan Salon series of events, and I'm sure we'll start doing that again as soon as we can. Have we done any, have we done any online sort of performances with that? Absolutely, yeah. I'm doing it about once a month. Okay. I've got a I've got a rock duo yeah. here with a Japanese guy, and we're called Nanka's Best. Nanka's Best. Nanka comes from Nanka and Felge, which was the pseudonym of Jagger and Richards when they were writing pop songs in the mid '60s. Yeah. So I always like that name Nanka. So we're called Nanka's Best, and we do an online show every month here. And I'm here, and he's in his house, oh, okay. which is which is about fifty miles away. And we found, and it's not easy to do, but we found the right software oh, where you can play. We can play from different houses, you know, with no latency. Exactly. Yeah, like it a, can be done. There's a. Definitely ask you about it. Well, there's a software made by Yamaha. Unfortunately, it's in Japanese and it only works in Japan. Uh, but that's what we're using. Typical, and you said about the high technology in Japan. Of course, it's Japanese, and it works. <laughs> yeah, it works great. Right, yeah. Um, what about the handcuffs? That's another another thing which which came up. Great band, yeah. Well, that came about. Here we go again. You see, I don't I don't knock on doors. Things happen. We did the American tour at the beginning of of 2019 so just two years ago we did an american tour we got great reviews all around and there was one particular review that i really liked it was full of swear words in the in the best way like this is morgan effing fisher ladies and gentlemen he's brilliant and stuff like that yeah. and just knocking anybody for daring to criticize us for being so old <laughs> and she's saying, you know, that our age is doesn't matter. And but it's such a great review, so enthusiastic and wild that I just emailed her and I said, thanks for an amazing review. And then I realized that she's a musician herself and has this band called The Handcuffs in Chicago. Mm. So I, I said, I really like what you do. And if you need some keyboards, let me know. And they said, oh, that'd be lovely. So... I played on two tracks of their album. One has just come out now on Facebook. I think I've, I've, I've uh, promoted it on Facebook. And they're a really good rock band. And uh, I hope we play together live one day. Yeah, wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Again, if you want, you know, any any links or anything you want to share, just, you know, a anything, it would we'd be, you know, happy to do that. Okay, uh, I'll send them to you. Thank you. The other thing I, no yeah. I noticed here was uh, you're an honorary member of the Japan Synthesizers Programmers Association, which I assume yeah. is actually quite quite an accolade, actually. Well, I suppose it is, but um, and it's actually, I think they've changed the name now. 
they've kept the JSPA, but it means something different now. And it might be it might be players rather than programmers now, which is more more accurate because I'm not really that great at programming. That's a bit nerdy in my view, but I like playing keyboards. And of course, I've played synthesizers almost since they first came out. So in the in the Morgan band in 1971, I was using quite a lot of synthesizers then. So I think it's just sheer longevity that gained me this accolade of being a honorary member. And uh, I've done things for them. You know, occasionally we do seminars. Uh, we do events for children about synthesizers and things like that. So it's an interesting group of people. I'm the only foreigner, I think, in the, in the group. And there's some really great musicians in this group. So it's been a pleasure to meet them. Yeah, Japan's a big old place, isn't it? You know, so there's plenty of plenty of competition. Well, there's every kind of music here, and they're so enthusiastic. Mm. When they go for a particular style of music, they go all the way. Like there's a, there's a pub I go to sometimes where they specialize in bluegrass. Oh yeah, and they've got all the right instruments, you know, mandolins and accordions and all that. But they wear the gear as well, the cowboy hats and you know things like that, and they change their name to cowboy names and they do the thing 200 percent and that's so japanese you know they'll focus on one thing you could take it all the way which of course is why the technology is so brilliant here so yeah. um, it's fascinating you know any genre of music you want you'll find it here you've done sold to you know, perfection you know yeah you've sold <laughs> it well to me i mean it sounds absolutely fantastic and see i can see why you love it so much um Taking you back to the to the to the early days, right? The Institute of Contemporary Art. Yeah. Uh, when you were, I suppose you, were, you 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 that's when you were a young young teenager, I suppose, was it? Um. So so, th this thing about uh, your love of kind of art, you know, you said about earlier on about I think it was your grandfather and the connection with art and. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about how in your mind if you can visualize i'll just just to put it in context i don't know if you ever come across a band called alien sex fiend maybe you have over the years i've heard of him yeah there's a guy the guy the main guy in the band is called nick fiend and I, I, he's it reminds me a little bit of you in terms of his mindset he kind of sees his music it's kind of like an artistic kind of vision so everything's kind of you know visual yeah is, yeah is it the same with you is it you know how do, is it like a crossing point is it just a fusion where do the two well, things i mean well, as soon as I was given freedom, which is when I started working with Cherry Red, I said, right, I'm going to do the album cover as well, definitely. And, you know, I never considered myself a qualified artist or a qualified musician for that matter. But, you know, I thought I'm going to play around with something. And for that album cover, I was like making collages and using the new color copy machines that had just arrived at that time. So like new technology, whoa, you know, and uh, it, was like, it was like kids playing really. But the point was that I realized that you can apply uh, your ideas from one form of art onto another form of art. So like the way of making music, like with overdubbing, it's like making collages with visual. It's like cut and paste you can do with sound and you can do it with art as well. So it's almost exactly the same way of thinking, just different tools. So it's perfectly natural that I found I could do that. And I think a lot of people, other people are like this chap from Sex Fiend, you know, that you just apply your thinking to something else. And um, so that's what I did. And uh, I remember making a series of postcards, which were collages of mainly 1950s magazines, very colorful, kitsch kind of ads and images and collaging them and then adding weird captions to them. And I made a series of postcards like that and sold them at the ICA. This would be in about 1979, I suppose. So um, great! It was great to have that freedom. You know, very exciting time. Well, and what do you what do you mean by uh, light painting? Ah, well, now this is something again uh, happened by accident. I was in Hawaii about 25 years ago. I lived there for a few months, and I was there at Christmas. And I noticed uh, in Hawaii, people decorate the outside of the house as well as the inside. So amazing, light displays all over the house, flashing and, you know. So I thought I must take some photos of these. 
So I went out with my camera and tried to take some photos. Of course, it being nighttime, you need to have a long exposure, slow shutter, you know. And I got the photos back the next day. This is prints, obviously, before digital. Hmm. And, and they were all blurred because I hadn't, hadn't held the camera steady. And at first I thought, well, that's a disaster. I really messed that up. Perhaps I should go out with a tripod next time and do it properly. But then I looked at the photos again. I thought, well, actually, this is quite interesting because you don't just see these clear images of houses. There's all these light trails from my wobbly hand. I thought, well, why not go the other way and, and move the camera more <laughs> instead of trying to hold it still and use these wonderful colored lights as your paintbrush, if you like. So that just got me started. And 25 years later, I still love doing it. Yeah. And I've refined the technique. The, the interesting thing is that what most people call light painting is where you do put the camera on a tripod and then you stand in front of it and you wave lights around in front of yeah. it yeah. with the shutter open. Yeah. So you're like drawing with light in the air, which is great and very creative. But to me, that has its limits because there's only so many kinds of lights you can hold in your hand yeah. and move around. Whereas if I move the camera, anything can be my light source. So it could be the lights of an airport yeah. or the Christmas illuminations in a city, or it could be the sun sparkling on the, on the sea. And there's so many different kinds of light that I can make use of that I haven't got bored with it yet. And I'm, uh, still refining the techniques and you know when I, I show them often when i do my ambient improv gigs and people often say how well they go together yeah. well i mean it's the same guy doing both isn't it so yeah um i think i think nick fiend i think the art came first for him and i suppose in a way for you it sort of it sort of did well and it sort of runs through everything you do but they they just it's just a marriage of the two isn't it yeah well i mean i was just lucky that the music took off so that that yeah was my first in to a creative life. So I kept the art as a hobby. Yeah. It still is really, but I can incorporate it more into my music now than I did before. And you exhibit though, I guess, do you? Sorry? Do you like exhibitions and put your work on? And I do, yeah. I mean, I've done several here. I've done one in England, one in America. And I have a special website for the art. Which again... So, um, you know happy to share i can say any, anything uh, thank you very much yeah on that um just sure. a couple of questions first of all, i just want to just not pretentiously but just show you the shirt which my brother-in-law bought me for my birthday save our i've seen that yeah. i've seen that somewhere on facebook haven't i just to say about um well i'll ask you this one since i've mentioned the shirt um how do you see the kind of future for up, up and coming musicians, you know, the, the way things have changed? Maybe if, if you even take the pandemic out of it, which I suppose is part of it, but, you know, like what's the point of forming a band these days because no one's going to buy your stuff anyway? And, you know, what, what do you think? Well, I don't know if they, are, if they aren't going to buy it because, I mean, you, that's the whole point is that the internet makes it open for anybody to promote their stuff. Hmm. And of course, that means there's too much stuff around. But still, for example, this Irish band, Keeley, yeah. are doing very, very well. And they've basically just been promoting themselves mainly on Facebook, I think. And uh, it's, it's starting to take off, you know. And uh, they've done a couple of videos, really good videos, and a couple of sort of virtual gigs. And so I remember reading quite a long time ago that if a band can get like maybe 2,000 people to regularly buy what they do, mm. they could live on that. Yeah. Mm. So if you, you know, so people are obviously getting much better at promoting themselves and finding their niche audience, which is fantastic because the, the audience can be anywhere in the world and still buy your downloads easily, instantly. Mm. And then hopefully as well buy your CDs or whatever else you're making. Yeah. So in some ways, it's, it's a very positive time that you start small mm. and you plant seeds and then they, they get passed on to the right people, the people who should know about you. I think it's a very creative time. 
So going back to when you were 18 and, and you know, you got into that band and they had number one hits and la, la, la. I suppose that, that was then, this is now, so that's kind of irrelevant. So we just do things, we look at, we, we forget about all that and we just live for the moment sort of thing. Well, yeah, I mean, in those days it was more top heavy. It was almost like you were this little band and there's this massive machine yeah. controlling your life, this huge record company and selling ridiculous amounts and not getting much money from it. Whereas this way, it's, it's completely reversed. Now where you're like, you're, you're in charge mm. and you just, you don't mind it if you start small, you get 10 new friends on Facebook. It's like, great. And that 10 becomes a hundred and they become a thousand. And, and that's the great thing. That is one great thing about selling music as downloads is it's instant. There's no limit. There's nothing to manufacture. There's almost no cost cost involved. And then once you do get good, you can start doing the, the vinyl version or whatever, which is exactly what a lot of bands are doing and what I'm planning to do as well. It suits me fine. Okay. Um, I, I mentioned earlier on that, uh, just got a couple of things really. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier on that I, I teach I teach in a, in, a, in a university, right? And it's in, in the field of media stuff, right? Right. Uh, but I've also got a podcast series, which is called uh, Creatrium. So they're based in a building called the Atrium. Oh, uh, yeah. The Faculty of Creative Industries. So Creatrium. So right. um, what are you what are your kind of thoughts on um, the um, focus, if you like, on on STEM kind of subjects, you know, science, technology, mathematics, and therefore a slight maybe um, dilution in the emphasis on the creativity? you know, and nurturing creativity, because it seems to be a thing at the moment. It's all about this, you know, science, technology, do all that stuff that matters. And then it's kind of to the detriment of creativity in a way. It's just pushed away. Well, the point is that my education was old style. So I grew up in the 50s and 60s, mm. but I was tremendously enthusiastic all the time. I was always told you're trying to do too much. And you can't possibly cover all those different subjects. I said, well, I want to. I want to do biology, mathematics, physics. I want to learn French. I want to learn the piano. I want to study art. I want to do it all. Yeah. And to me, the enthusiasm of studying, like studying, like I say, is more like absorbing, really. Um, it, it all helps. It all feeds back into each other. You know what I mean? So you learn about how atoms work. And that's so fantastic and inspiring. You kind of imply you can apply that to how a computer works and how a keyboard works, and it all sort of cross pollinates itself. You see what I mean? So I think in, unless you get nerdy and stuck on one pattern only, then it's then it can be a bit uh, self defeating. Whereas if you got if you got enthusiasm for a whole variety of things. My personal experience after all these years is that it just it just keeps itself going. It keeps renewing itself. Right. So um again, this is like a tremendously opportune time that all this knowledge is available like that yeah. for free. Unfortunately, people think music should be free as well. Exactly. Well, <laughs> in an ideal world, yes, but not be free forever though, can it? You know, not really. Not, not unless everything else is free. Yeah. Food, rent. If everything's free, no problem. Unfortunately, uh, it's not. A final question for you. Um, I don't know. Do, do you have any regrets on your career at all or anything you wish you'd done differently? Or, you know, or, or not? Well, you know, I think regrets never help much. Um, I sometimes think about that. Like, if I'd never left London... Would I like by now have like my own orchestra or my own radio show or TV show like a lot of people I know do? You know, people who are like less famous than me are now like big deal personalities or successful composers, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I, I don't give it much house room, that kind of thinking, you know, because it doesn't help anything. Um, so, Frankly, I don't really have regrets. Good. I think there's been the odd 
slight mistake in personal life as well as musical life, you know. But um, I just generally feel very grateful for everything that's happened. And I think my approach to life means that like, unlike, say, Queen or The Who, who've like maintained success for decades, and sometimes even they've got bored with it, I think. Mm -hmm. This idea of we must hang on to success and riches and success and all that, we mustn't let it go, has never bothered me much. And I know that there's been peaks and then there have been troughs. And again, but life's like that. And I think life is cyclic. And I, and I, I quite get used to the, to the low energy parts and then the high wild energy parts as well. I think it's good to have both, frankly. I think you need a rest sometimes. Yeah. From the from the rat race, you know. So I mean I could go out and do a tour with Mother Hoople two years ago. And I had absolutely no problem playing the songs that I hadn't played for 40 years. And we went out there and we pretty much did it better than we used to. Yeah. And we got better reviews than we used to. Extraordinarily good reviews. And then I come back to my quiet life and do a little ambient music and a bit of photography. And it's like, I, I love this kind of changing, like the seasons, you know. I couldn't live in Los Angeles. I tried because it's all the same season. I need, I need changes. I'm British, you know. I need four, four specific seasons. And I think life in general suits me like that. Okay, well, that's a, that's a great answer. So, wow. uh, Morgan Fisher, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. A pleasure to talk to you, and, and thank you, everyone, for listening or, or watching. And take care, everyone. Stay safe.